Okay, yeah, so last movie of the Christmas Marathon, a very phantasm Christmas we're having here, and they want me to say something all mushy and warm-hearted and optimistic and cheesy and Christmassy, because that's what you do at the end of the Christmas Marathon. But I just really don't do mushy, much less cheesy. But um, I will talk about men of goodwill. This is the only time you ever hear anybody say that. We're supposed to be men of goodwill. But that expression is really old-fashioned. They just use it in the courts, especially when the topic is contract law, because when two guys sign an agreement, they're expected to be frank and open about their intentions. So the contract says you must be a man of goodwill, otherwise I'll sue you. I'll tell you, though, the only time they used it in the real way it's supposed to be used was in the Linus speech in A Charlie Brown Christmas. Do you realize how revolutionary that one show was? Now, we're going back to 1965. For those of you who haven't re-watched that show lately, let me set up that speech for you. Charlie Brown is trying to put on a Christmas pageant, but he's, he's been completely humiliated, and he's standing next to the symbol of his humiliation, the most pathetic Christmas tree ever harvested or displayed. So he's defeated. He's done. And he says, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And then Linus Van Pelt speaks up the most insecure child in the neighborhood, actually the only kid in the show who does not laugh at Charlie Brown for his failure. And he says, sure, Charlie Brown, I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Linus then walks to the center of the stage and he says, lights please. And he does a verbatim recitation of the New Testament book of Luke, chapter two, verses eight through 11 in the King James Version. Now, that's four verses straight out of the Protestant Bible. Do you know how many TV executives read the Protestant Bible and want it in their programming? I guess one, at least, because they left this speech in. Do you realize what would happen today if you put that many words of direct Bible text into a script? So here's what Linus says, and he has that shaky pre-adolescent voice. He says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said, fear not. Now here's the interesting thing. On the words fear not, Linus drops his security blanket. Obviously the moment when he loses all fear. And then as though transformed into a prophet, he completes the passage. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. So Linus then picks up the security blanket and he walks back over to Charlie Brown and he says, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. I think it's the only time Linus ever talked without his security blanket. So obviously the creators of the show were making a point and they were making a religious point on network TV. They even left in a savior, which is Christ the Lord, the part that never gets mentioned in Christmas specials. So now to this day, the Catholics don't like this. They consider this scene a heresy because it ends with that goodwill toward men thing. But they say, the Catholics say, and this is not a new thing. They've been saying this for centuries. The Catholics say that the King James Bible got one of the letters wrong in the Greek text. So those angels singing about God's goodwill toward all men is a misreading of the last line. It should read, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill to those he favors indicating that God is offering his peace message only to those who are deserving of his peace message. So leave it to the Catholics to throw cold water on Linus Van Pelt. Of course, we Scots-Irish Protestants much prefer the Linus King James Version, if only because it's more ecumenical and Christmassy, and it would presumably include an invitation to Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and atheists, along with those Christians who have fallen away from the faith, and uh, because Protestants are all about the invitation, right? The invitation to join in. They do that all the time. The birth of Jesus is, according to Linus, a cosmic event that has no denomination. Now, unfortunately, the Catholics are probably right about the text. I'm not going to go into it. Oh, what the hell? I'm, I'm, I'm this deep. I'm this deep into this thing. I'm going to go into it. 
They wanted me to talk about Christmas, okay? I'm, I'm going to frickin' talk about Christmas, all right? The phrase that translates into goodwill toward men in the original Greek is anthropos eudokia, all right? <laughs> but in the five oldest manuscripts of the book of Luke, eudokia does not appear. The second word is spelled eudokias, and that S on the end changes the meaning entirely. So when it has the S on it, which is the five earliest manuscripts, it doesn't mean goodwill to men. It means goodwill to those God favors. The first time it gets changed is around 170 AD. One of those harmonies they had, one of those books that combine all four gospels into one book. And the author of that book called the Diatessaron, right now people are going, what the fuck is Joe Bob doing? <laughs> the, author, the author of the Diatessaron was a guy named Tatian who was not, who was not considered very reliable, so he may have simply omitted the S by mistake. At any rate, men in whom God is well pleased became all men, and then it became even more confusing over the succeeding centuries when we started to attach goodwill to people. So the good, goodwill is not just God-given goodwill, but people who are considered benevolent people, kindly people, peaceful people, godly people. We changed something God was offering to man into something men could offer to one another. So perhaps the most famous use of the phrase came in 1956, Martin Luther King Jr., a Protestant preacher named after the original Protestant, and he was talking about the Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus Board of Education, and he said, to all men of goodwill, this decision came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of human captivity, one of his best speeches. But of course, by limiting the shared joy to men of goodwill, the Reverend King implied there are men of bad will, you know, men who would not respect Brown versus Board of Education, many of them Christian, many of whom thought the promised land was segregated. And that's kind of why I'm talking about it right now, because now the men of bad will have returned. Because we just finished a horrendous year of angry, wrathful people in Washington, D.C. I don't care whose side you're on. You got to admit, we've never had this many people dividing the country into us and them. So my recommend recommendation for this sorry state of affairs is let's listen to Linus, okay? Now, how can we do that? Because we've, we've already proven it's not biblical. So here's my theory about Luke 2.11. The verses Linus quotes in the show, men of goodwill. I'm going to get so much crap on Twitter for this. People are going crazy. I think the Catholics are right about what Luke wrote down in the first century, but I'm going to be very Protestant, and I'm going to suggest that our understanding of God's will is a progressive living thing. It evolves. It's accessible to all. When encountered by four men in the year 1965, the words goodwill were understood in both senses, a blessing to all, and an injunction to take God's goodwill and transfer it abundantly to others. Now, would God do that? Would God work out the meaning of Scripture through the mundane work of a cartoonist named Charles Schultz and a television producer named Lee Mendelson and a director named Bill Melendez and a jazz pianist and composer named Vince Guaraldi? Would God proclaim a gift of universal peace and at the same time command us to preserve that peace in the form of something so weird as an animated American television special? Yes, I think he would. I think he did. I think the gospel turns up in the strangest places. I think it even turns up in a nation full of bad will. Was that Christmassy enough for you? Now, a whole new thing starts on the Internet. Remember that time at Christmas when Joe Bob started doing biblical exegesis? Yeah. He had overdosed on that low-proof bourbon and phantasm movies. It was, uh, that was a train wreck that night. I read that stuff you guys write on the Internet. And speaking of train wrecks, we're about to watch Phantasm Ravager. And the big V in Ravager tells us it's Phantasm Five. I never know how to pronounce those titles. Phantasm Raphae Verger. <laughs> this is one where Reggie is either somewhere out on the open road blowing away demons and zombies and silver spheres, or he's being wheeled around in a nursing home diagnosed with dementia, and he doesn't know whether he's remembering what really happened, what's happening now, or what's possibly going on in another parallel dimension. But the tall man is now a shapeshifter with the power to alter time and to replicate himself, and there are thousands of tall men. And I don't want to say this movie asks more questions than it answers, 
But yeah, this is not a good flick to wind up the franchise with because it has more loose ends than a John Waters Christmas party at last call. So the final <laughs> performance of Angus Scrim winding up the Phantasm franchise, and we have 23 dead bodies, one dead horse, flying sphere sharpshooting with two explosions, multiple monk dwarves, six exploding heads with green goop, CUDA hijacking, hijacking of a CUDA hijacker, head squashing, triple flying spheres with neck kill, sphere to the jugular, nursing home firefight with zombies, fear the size of a small planet, traditional sphere to the forehead with blood spurt, non-elective brain surgery, exploding bimbo, dementia foo, laser sighted machine gun foo, gas mask foo, Drive-In Academy Award nominations for Stephen Jutras as Chunk, the Dwarf Commando, Daniel Schweiger as the Cuda Thief, who finds out what happens to people who steal Hemikudas in a Phantasm movie, Daniel Roebuck as the Bulgarian farmhand who tries to fight a flying sphere with an axe, Reggie Bannister for kicking ass in and out of a wheelchair, and David Hartman, the director, who managed to complete this movie with Don Coscarelli breathing down his neck, because. Don is not exactly a hands-off kind of guy. Three stars. Joe Bob says, check it out. See, you're not supposed to talk about the Bible on TV anymore. One time, my church, they had this preacher from North Carolina, and uh, he believed in the absolute literal truth of the Bible. So I said to him one day, hey, preach, how about this verse? I found this verse from Song of Solomon. It says, thy teeth are as a flock of sheep. That might just be a metaphor, you know? <laughs> it might not be exactly what it says on the page. Although you, Mr. Went to Southwestern Seminary dude, so much comes out of your mouth on a weekly basis, I wouldn't rule out a flock of sheep being one of them. <laughs>